If you have your Bibles with you, we'd ask you to turn to the book of Haggai. Uh, it's toward the end of the Old Testament. The minor prophets are not preached out of that much. Um, they're not minor because they're not important. They're minor because they're short books. Uh, Haggai chapter 2, and we're going to begin reading in the first verse. Haggai chapter 2 in the first verse, the Bible says, In the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shetael, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, who is left among you that saw the house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest, and be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work. For I, say in, I, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for an opportunity to be with your people this morning. Uh, we thank you for a place to meet in out of the weather this morning and for the provision for it. God, we pray that you would meet with us this morning. We pray that you would send the person of the Holy Ghost in and among us and Make your word a living word and your light a bright and shining light unto us. And we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Amen. Now, you don't have a lot of preaching from Haggai in the modern day. Uh, Haggai was the contemporary of Zechariah. Uh, he lived about 520 years before the 400 years of silence. Or I guess I should say he lived about 120 years before the years of silent and about uh, 520 years from the days of John the Baptist. Now, uh, Haggai recognized that things were getting bad. Uh, he anticipated that God's people had gotten in such a way that they probably uh, were not going uh, to be back in the, the will of the Lord anytime soon. Also, everything that Haggai said came from the Lord. Now, after 25, almost 30 years of preaching, I can say this, uh, uh, young people don't say anything without the leading of the Lord. Now, we're raising up of a generation of preachers, and I appreciate them very much, but they like to hear their self speak much more than they like just hearing what God has to say to them. <clears throat> uh, thing, uh, doctrinal preaching certainly is what we need, and it has its place, but uh, throwing around big terms is not to the benefit of everybody, and I believe Haggai saw that. He he pointed them to real things that they could see and touch that manifested the signs of the times. Uh, it manifested who uh, and where they were at as God's people. So going back to the first verse, the Bible says, In the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai. Now, it is very important uh, first of all, just remember every word in the Bible is important. Yeah. Uh, it's not thrown in there for happenstance, and uh, some of it is quite boring to the flesh, and we're just being honest about that. Those seemingly endless genealogies, uh, sometimes it's hard to stick with that stuff. But if you follow those endless genealogy, genealogies, you will find them coming from the person of Adam right down to the person of Christ. Uh, it shows the reality of a, of a creation period. It, it, it certainly records 
that the, it is impossible for the world to be, be billions of years old. It's all important. Now we'll see in a moment why this seventh month is important. Um, now we'll find and we'll, we'll see in a minute it was a while before the Lord spake again. Now when you get as old as I am and the Lord moves a people and he meets with God's man and the Holy Ghost uh, 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 magnifies or verifies what he says, you know what I mean. Uh, that's the seasoning of preaching. That, that, is, that is what we need in the modern day. And so when we don't get it, we tend to be brutish but what would you like to what would you like to uh, wait two months for the next sermon? Mm -hmm. uh, what what would you think about waiting four hundred years from hearing from the Almighty? See, we really don't know how good we have it. So uh, to begin his uh, exhortation, Haggai gives us a time of when it happened. Now another thing that we seem to leave off is whom it is addressed to. Now, certainly the, the full counsel of God is addressed to all of us, but when it's addressed to an individual, spe pay special attention to that individual. Who is this person? Why, why are they mentioned? What was, their, what was their role in the history of Israel? Look at what they do because what they do, or excuse me, whom they are, is very important to understanding the message. He says, speak, on, speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shetael, governor of Judah. Now, we won't get very much into government because almost to the day which we live today, it's pointless. But I want you to see that people that are elected, people that are placed in governmental offices are still accountable. Now, uh, we, we live in a day which almost government is a mockery to the, to the God of the Bible. But remember this, that there is an answering day for that. Uh, the Bible says that everyone would, uh, would go before the Almighty and say what sort of work theirs was. Uh, don't stress about Obama. He'll bow his knee to the Almighty and he will give an accounting of what he done. Why? Because he was in a government office. Everybody will. But he was doubly responsible because he was a type of a governor. And, and our, our, our government agents will be the very same way. And so we see a great deal of responsibility that Haggai pulls in on this person. Secondly, he says... Uh, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the residue of the people saved. Now, in addition to the government being responsible, God's men are responsible. God, God's uh, people, preaching men, we are extra responsible. Probably one of the most difficult things for me reconciling myself to the ministry is because the, the responsibility scared me. When you're preaching the Word of God, yeah. listen, you're doubly accountable. Mm -hmm. You better know what you're preaching, and you better know even deeper than that why you're preaching it. Mm -hmm. uh, listen, this is not a profession to gain money in. You're handling the very sword, the Word of God. And, and, and so it needs to be treated that way. So he brings into special accountability two groups of people, the government and the preaching men of God. In that time, the high priest. And so they were responsible. And then I want you to see, he, and he even names it, the residue of the people. So that means you're responsible as well. The residue, what little bit is left, that little bit that remains, because most of them were where? They were in captivity, right? They were, no, they were no, nowhere near the land of Israel. They, they, they had been removed from their spot. 
You know, have you ever seen a, a man of God that you had confidence in and because of sin removed? removed? See, that, 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 uh, that captivity is for our learning purposes. It, it's not just to know that God delivered them. Certainly that's important. But if you play with sin long enough, you're going to be captive by it. And, and if you're close to it, you're at risk. And, and so we find that everyone of God's people in that place and in that time were responsible. Now, what are they responsible for? Who is left among you that saw the house in her first glory? Think about the day that the Lord saved you. You, you, you saw Christ in His glory, whether you appreciated it or not. You saw Him as the answer to His sin, to your sin. He, you saw Him, uh, the remedy for the situation that you were in. You saw Him in His glory. And, and since then, since the Lord saved you, I, I certainly hope that you've had time uh, in preaching hours and just in private prayer time, prayer time where you seem so close to the Lord that, that you thrilled at His presence. Remember uh, in Isaiah chapter 6, he said, I, uh, he saw the Lord high and lifted up. Remember on the Isle of Patmos, the, uh, John said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now, now, now those types of experiences are rare and should, and, and should be, and, and should be uh, uh, valued. Now, in the very same way, he asked the people, who is it that remembers the glory of the first house of the Lord? Now, if you know your Bible, there ended up being three. And the, the first one was magnificent. Uh, the one that Solomon had built was the most glorious of them all. And he says, who remembers that beauty? Now, I'll ask you this, and, and, and what our beauty in the modern day church is, we, we can't see the temple, and we don't even have a temple. A temple's not necessary anymore. Uh, but who has seen real revival? I mean, you think about that. I'm 54 years old, and I'd be willing to say the closest thing I've seen was a ripple in the pond up at New Test, I mean, up at Bumpus Mills Baptist Church, and I guess Adam was nine. The Lord saved him during that meeting. You know what? That's been, I'm going to tell you how old Adam is. Uh, that's been 23 years ago. That's a long, long dry spell, is it not? Yeah. Now, we've convinced in the modern day, especially Sovereign Grace churches, I actually heard a meeting. I heard a man say, and I've been to his church, and I knew it wasn't true. Oh, we have revival every Sunday. No, you don't. No, you most certainly do not. <laughs> if the people of Israel only got a good dose occasionally, why would we get anything better? But that little meeting, you know, see, Adam was saved, and an old man that was a private eye for the government was saved. And there was one other, I don't remember the other person. Was it Brandy? I can't remember. And uh, uh, man, that gave me enough igniting that I knew I wanted to see it again. But now you think about it, 20 years is a long dry spell, 21 years. And then we have children. Adam, man, I know he, he remembers when the Lord saves him, saved him, but I don't know how much he remembers about the meeting. Sarah was, was three. I know she don't remember it. I would dare to say Matthew don't remember it. And, you know, uh, he said, so ask yourself, do you remember that? Do you remember when a time when God met with his people so sufficiently that you can say, yes, I've seen a revival. We need that today, do we not? We, we, we desperately need that. Now, I also say, because this is always 
the boo-hoo, woom, woom, woom. Well, there's not that much of us left. Well, the people here was called a residue, ju just a small amount of people. So don't use numbers as an excuse that God won't meet with his people because it's simply not true. And, and so we see then, he asked them, do you remember? Do you remember how glorious it was? And then he says, and how do you see it now? You remember how magnificent it was. What does it look like now? You know, I've, I've read uh, books on the Great Awakening that happened in the late 1700s and then it, it, again in the beginning of the early 1800s. And uh, they saw things uh, that made them hungry enough to want to see it again. Now, uh, look around. Let's be honest. What do we have today? Uh, you go to the, you go to the Lord's churches. Now, I'll say we had a wonderful fellowship uh, Friday night uh, at um, Olmstead Baptist Church. That building is seat about probably two hundred, and it, it 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 was pretty it was pretty full. That, that thrilled my heart. You, first thing for revival is an interest of God's people. Yeah. An interest in individually wanting to be closer to the Lord than you are now. Now, secondly, it's an interest of God's people wanting the lost to be saved. Now, listen, it's not Armenian to desire for someone else to be saved. If you, if you get to the point, well, if they're saved, they're saved, and if they're not, they're not, uh, you need to go over at Paris because there's still a primitive Baptist down there that you can attend over there. You see what I'm saying? Uh, we need to have a desire for lost people. Look around us. I mean, we live in a day and age where men are marrying men. Look at what we have left. So he said, take notice. Look at the temple. It's in shambles. Look at the temple. It's caving in. Is that what we want? Certainly not. Uh, I, I want to see more revival as the, as, the day, as the day of the Lord's coming approaches. I want to be near unto him. So he says, you look at it now and you look at it then. Is it not in your eyes in comparison it as nothing. That's a big strong word, isn't it? It's nothing. It's nothing like you remember. It's nothing like you see. It's nothing like what we did. It, it, it's nothing. Those are very, very strong words to be procured from the Word of God. Nothing. And so we see a good spiritual measure this morning, do you want more than that? I know, I know that I do. I want more than nothing, do you not? Uh, I don't think it's, spirit, uh, it, it's selfish as a spiritual being to want more than I have now, do you? Now in the flesh, that's always us, uh, self, uh, uh, self boasting. I want more money, I want a bigger house, but in spiritual things, it's not. It, it's a very natural thing. All of us has raised babies. And it's a very natural thing for those kids to be hungry and to eat. In fact, uh, Adam was our one child and we had difficulty getting him to eat properly. Uh, we finally found a formula that worked. You know, it was a concern for me and his mama that he wouldn't eat. And if he did eat, it made him sick then why are we no more concerned in the modern day about each other? Right? Mm -hmm. I've seen countless people, elderly people, and they lose, their, uh, they lose their drive to eat. We call that in nursing failure to thrive. And they no longer want it. You know what? If you go long enough without eating, you won't not want it anymore. It, it, it won't mean nothing to you. It, it, it doesn't strike you as appealing. And I think that was the situation that Jerusalem had gotten into. They had gone without for so long 
They didn't anticipate anything. You know what we need? We need our appetites wetted up good to want more. And if you, if you have the slightest uh, taste of what's good, you'll want that. Verse 5, uh, according to the word that I covenanted with you, when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. Now notice that God made a covenant with them to be with them, and he would be their guide when they came out of Egypt. You know, uh, mankind is promise breakers. God is a faithful, is a faithful promiser. When he makes a covenant, it will come to pass. When he makes a promise, you can depend on it. And he said, I'll be with you. So if he made that promise, where does the problem lie? Right? We, we, we need that in the modern day. We need to experience revival in, in, a, in a wonderful and a magnificent way. So he says, according to the word of God, I covenant with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth in, in among you, fear ye not. Now, there's two ways you can look at that. You say, don't be afraid. You're going to be okay. Or, fear ye not? A question. Now, if I read a pathology report, and it said stage 4 cancer in the lungs, in the liver, and in the brain, What's the natural response? Let's be honest. Fear. My sister was a nurse. We graduated from nursing school, two different nursing schools, but we graduated nursing school the same year. When she read that pathology report, it wasn't someone ignorant that didn't understand the terms. Judy knew exactly what it meant. Think it stirred up fear in her? I believe it did, don't you? I, I read it too, and you know what? It stirred up fear in me. Did I know that if Judy was genuinely saved, that it was going to be all right? Sure. But it's still fearful, isn't it? Then why are we not fearful when God doesn't meet with us? I think we value the flesh more than we do the spirit, don't you? So we, we ought to desire that as God's people. I know this. Uh, I, I want to meet with God more and more. I want Him to come down and to be with us more and more as time goes by. It's a natural drive if you're spiritually healthy. Now, if you're not spiritually healthy, if we had stayed, you know what? We couldn't get Judy to eat nothing at the end. She simply didn't want it. When she was diagnosed with cancer, she weighed 220 pounds, and she was about like this. She was much shorter than me. When she died, she weighed 115 pounds. And you know why? It wasn't because Judy was being obstinate. She didn't want it anymore. The disease was so advanced she wasn't interested. And, and, and in the very same way, if we go without long enough, we're no longer desirous of it. We no, we no longer have that drive to eat. And so, yeah, I do fear getting like that, don't you? I fear when my spiritual appetite is quenched. I fear when I'm no longer interested in going down to the house of God. I, I'm fearful when I don't love this old book anymore. I am very, very fearful. And if you're redeemed, you should feel the same way. Verse 6, but, I mean, excuse me, for thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. Now, uh, do you like a little shake every once in a while? Just a little, a, li a little tremble to let you know that God's still there, that he's on the throne. Maybe you're reading privately in your home and you're like, whoo, glory to God. I had not seen that one before. See, I like to tremor, don't you? Uh, I, I like just, and, and, and maybe a preacher you really don't even know, and, and, and maybe he's not the same style of preacher you are, and maybe it's a little dry, and, and he reads something there, and you're like, whoo, I never saw that before. Yeah. 
See, we, we need those little tremor, tremors, don't we? But besides a tremor, I want the wind blowing so hard it would knock me down and the earth shaking that I can't even stand up, don't you? That, that's revival. People, people in the modern age don't even know what revival is. And, and that probably goes back to World War II. That's, that's probably how far back it's been. And, and, and so we see, uh, he gives them the promise, yeah, it's going to happen at times. Uh, I am still the giver of that. <laughs> I will make all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, I want you to see who is the giver of the desires. It says here the, that the Lord God is. Now, very occasionally, I've seen cancers, cancer patients come back. Uh, we stop the, and, and, and you know, it, it's necessary sometimes, but if anybody ever tells you this, they don't know what they're talking about. You know what chemotherapy is? It's poison. That literally is what it is. Now, the goal is that it will only kill the cancer cells. But I, I'm here to tell you, Again, that is not what happens. <laughs> it kills the good ones too. That's why people lose their hair and uh, get so sick with it. But I've seen when people stop the treatment sometimes or maybe their treatment is completed and, and it worked and things are good again, their appetite comes back. You know, that, that, that's a great lesson. And so here we find a uh, we find a promise, and he says, "I'm gonna I'm gonna bring your appetite back. I'm gonna make everybody want this again." You know that's a glorious thing. Now I've went through some dry spells in my life, but you know it's a sweet, wonderful thing when your appetite returns. And uh, after uh, my brain surgery, I, I didn't care anything about eating. I just didn't want it. And uh, Donna, what would you like? I'll fix anything you want. Wasn't without lack of trying, but she could fix my favorite meal, my favorite thing ever to eat, and she does it one time a year because of my sugar, is caramel pie. I absolutely love caramel pie. She fixed me one, and I ate one piece. You see what I'm saying? I want some appetite back. Now you can see I recovered from that. <laughs> and uh, uh, I started wanting food again. But I want to uh, spiritually recover from that. I, I want to crave the Word of God. I, I want, you know, uh, and, and I love worship service. I believe God's people are called to worship. But how are the redeemed encouraged and how are the lost saved? Through the foolishness of preaching. Now we live in a day of entertainment, do we not? You see these huge buildings that call themselves churches and, and it looks like a rock concert from the 80s. The bell is hung up on the 80s right now. And uh, that's, that's what it looks like. And you know what? It's the same thing that tickled the us in the 80s that tickles them. You see what I'm saying? So when we, we think revival, certainly we want to crave the right thing, right? And that's preaching. Uh, that, that's the Word of God. That, that's man, man, the man of God being faithful to that book. That is real, true, old-time preaching. And that's certainly, certainly what we need. Verse 8. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine saith the Lord God of hosts. Now if you own it, who has the authority to give it? The Almighty, right? He own, and I'm not talking about silver and gold, like which I, I think that he owns the financial part too, but I'm talking about spiritual things. You know who's the grantor of revival? The Almighty. He owns it, he gives it, he provides it. He is the one in control. 
That's why we need to cry out to Him. Listen, it, it, it don't come from tickling this flesh. It comes from the Almighty. It, it, it is granted. It's a spiritual thing. It's something that comes from, from the, the Lord God Himself. And certainly, certainly we ought to desire it. That ought to be, that ought to be our first desire. Verse 9, the glory, of the, the glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former. And I personally believe, and you can study it out, take this for what it's worth, I believe that he's talking about uh, the older house, the first house is being the law, and that the new house is grace. He said it's going to be a lot better, and certainly it is. We don't have to worry about the law anymore. We can rejoice in, in, in the provision of grace. The glory of this uh, latter house shall be greater than the formal, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Now peace. We, if there's been a theme of my ministry, there's two things. Separation from this present evil world and desiring peace in a very unpeaceful day. You stressed about them balloons? I'm not. I have peace about it. You know, uh, were you stressed about COVID? I wasn't. I've seen people die with it. Literally, I've seen people die with COVID. Watch them die with COVID. Was I scared of it? No. Because I have a peace, the Bible says, that passeth all understanding. If I die, I die. All right? And, and, and so we see then that we, uh, the Lord God says that he would bring that in a bleak and a dark hour. Verse 10. Two months later. Now we have to, uh, ex uh, we have to believe and we have to think that there was a two-month interval that they did not hear from God. Uh, Haggai heard nothing, so he shared nothing. You see what I'm saying? Wouldn't that be a wonderful place to be at in the modern day? In the fourth and twentieth day of the ninth month, the first month was the seventh on the twenty-first on the twentieth, and this is two months later in um, in uh, in September, our September on the twenty-fourth, and and there was a little uh, waiting period in there. You know what, church? There's going to be a waiting period. We want everything. You know how this old fleshly religion got started? The inability to wait. Oh, man, if it ain't going to come, we'll play some music. If it ain't going to come, we're going to go, woohoo! We'll do some jumping jacks and see what that does. You know what? That, that's not outside of the realm of possibility. When Moses went up on the mount first time for 40 days, what did Aaron do? He built them some religion. That's what they wanted, right? So he sufficed it. He made them golden calf. And, and that is an Egyptian god. They, they just didn't pull that out of thin air. They were bringing over what they could. Uh, they were taking with them what they brought over. Religion. Empty religion. <laughs> Remember how he lied to Moses when they got back? Well, I threw it in there and the, and the calf walked out. You know what? I'm not a very good liar, but I believe I could come up with something better than that. <laughs> All right? And so we see that there's always a waiting period. Don't be discouraged that there's a waiting period and you may be get sleepy and you may get spiritually tired, but there's a waiting period. In the fourth and twentieth day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priest concerning the law, saying, now, I don't know, and uh, maybe better Bible historians than I am can tell you, but if it's not recorded, I have to assume they did nothing. Right? He gave them some encouragement, he gave them some instruction, and nothing happens, right? 
Remember, remember when they uh, were uh, rebuilding the wall in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah? And there was the responsibility that every man would restore the wall, the section in front of their house. That was their individual responsibility. And you know what? They did it. And they did it in record time. And it was just as strong as, as the first one. And here we have a group of people, so, uh, a, a group of individuals that says, he's, the Haggai's message was this, step up to the plate. And the best we know, they did. Right? The best we understand, they, they, they made no advancement, they made no prayer, they made no movement to the word, the spoken word of God. So the Lord's response, thus saith the Lord of hosts, ask now the priest concerning the law. What does the law of God say? What is the law of God state? The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, ask now the priest uh, concerning the law, saying, if one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, and with his skirt do, do, touch, do, not, do touch bread or pottage or wine, uh, or oil, or any shall be, shall any be holy? And the priest answered and said, No. Now, what this really means, they're doing good works, and I mean, it's crazy to me to think somebody carrying down a dead piece of fish in, uh, in, 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 their, in their skirt, but apparently that's what they were doing. To me, fish is the quickest. Now, I love fish. I'm seeking some this, this morning. But it stinks quicker than any meat you'll eat. If you don't cook it, it's going to stink. And so they're walking around with something stinking in their skirts. You know what? Whether you realize it or not, you are too. The redeemed even walk around something stinking in their skirt, and it's what they love in this present evil world. It's what they do to entice the flesh in this present evil world. Well, what does the Bible say that our sin was to the Almighty? A stink in the nostrils of God, right? And so we find, he says, do you got this? And they said, no, we wouldn't touch that stinking thing in our, in our, in our skirts. Then why is it there? Who's going to take it out? What are you going to do with it? You got to deal with it. Then said Haggai, is one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these? Shall it be unclean? In other words, the undertaker, if he, if, he, if he deals with the body, is he unclean? And the priest answered, and, it said, and said, it shall be unclean. Now this is the thing, they, they had a period of time they were unclean, and then they could go before the temple and get cleaned up again. But you know what? Somebody had to deal with that dead body, did they not? What happens to a dead body if it's left? Back to our thing, it stinks. <laughs> One time in healthcare that I threw up, and I mean, I threw up like you wouldn't believe. And uh, down at Indian Mound, this woman had a little, a little house built behind her son's house, a little two-room house, and it had a little bathroom in it. And the old woman died in her sleep. It is all it's the hottest day in August you've ever seen. And, and man, when we got out there, she was ripe. And I was working with an old boy, and uh, he asked, well, when was the last time you seen her? And uh, they said about three hours ago, and he laughed in their face. <laughs> and so we went in there to retrieve the body. And it was so bad, I had to run back on the porch and throw up before I could go get the body. It was, it was a stink. It, it was an unbelievable mess. And that's us without Christ, is it not? If Christ doesn't intervene, when, and I still remember the woman's name, I'm not going to use it, but after 30 years, I still remember who she is. It, it left an etching in my mind. And 
so the very same way uh, these self-righteous Jews says, oh, they have to deal with the body, but they're unclean because they deal with the body. Is someone that deals with sin unclean? I don't think so. I think if they deal with their sin, it's wise. Do you know that? It, it, it's important to, to deal with things that creep in our life. And so they, he asked them then, verse 14, then answered Haggai and says, so it is this people, and so it, it is this nation before me with the Lord, so is every work of their hands and that which they offer there is unclean. And so that's why I say they did nothing in response to what Haggai's warning was because they still stunk. They, they still appeared as a dead body. They, and you can preach to the end of your life, but if God don't move a people, they're still going to stink. If, if I don't draw nigh to God, and you know what? Sometimes it's hard. You know how selfish you've been. You know how ungodly you've been. You know how fake we can be. And we're going to, in that stinking condition, go toward God? I think we have to, do you not? Now, I think we have to move in that direction. And when we, uh, when we come humbly to Him, you know what? We won't stink anymore. That sin has to be dealt with. So we know from history that they didn't listen to Haggai. They didn't listen to Zechariah. They didn't listen to Malachi. And so what was the result? They didn't hear from God. We live in a strange day, do we not? We need to hear from God. I can't make that happen. You can't make that happen. But what does your want wanter say? My, my wanter says I want to spend time with God. My desire, that's the biblical term for your wanter. <laughs> my desire is to hear from God. To know what he's saying to me. To, to, to not only know what he's saying to me, but to be obedient. Is that not revival in a nutshell? Be obedient unto God. That FBI agent I told you about that the Lord saved down there at Bumpus Mills, or up there at Bumpus Mills, I guess I should say. The uh, Lord was dealing with him. And he felt impressed to be, to be saved. And he ignored the warning of God. And he said the next night he came, it was dry and cold as crackers. And then the next night, the Lord spoke to him again. The Lord saved him. But he said, I was terrified in that one day period when there was no speaking of God. That one day when God did not move with him, it terrified him. Can you imagine 400 years? 400 years of perfect silence. I want to hear from the Lord, don't you? I want him to... I want him to speak to me, and I, I want him to speak through me. I believe if, if, if a preacher is sincere, I believe that's the sum of his ministry, do you not? And so I ask you, when was the last time the Lord spoke to you? When was the last time that you felt that thrill that you felt when the Lord saved your soul? When's the last time that, that you set in on even a partial revival? We need that today. We need that more than we ever have needed it before. Yeah. Mm -hmm.